So first I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Bailey. He received his bachelor's in history from the University of Oklahoma and his master's and PhD in anthropology from the University of Oregon. Uh, his research and research interests are in contemporary Indians of the United States and Canada, the historic tribes of the Prairie Plains and the Southwest, and with a special interest on, in the Osage and, um, and the Navajo. He teaches culture, people, and nature, general anthropology. He teaches a course on North American Indians. He's a member of the American Anthropological Association, the American Ethnological Society, and the American Society for Ethnohistory. He's a member also of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act Review Committee and uh, the Committee to Review the Glen Canyon Environmental Studies. Th these were past memberships. And he's a senior fellow at the National Museum of Natural History in the Smithsonian Institution. He's published The Art of the Osage with Daniel Swan, Continuity and Change in Mississippian Civilization in Hero, Hawk, and Open Hand, The American Indian Art of the Ancient Mid Midwest and South, and Indians in Contemporary Society in the Handbook of North American Indians. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Garrick Bailey. Thank you. I can't see anybody out there. I'm blinded by the lights. I don't know who's here. It's always dangerous when you can't see their eyes. You don't know what they're doing. But I also can't see you leave either in case uh, my lecture becomes a little boring. Uh, first of all, I, 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 I always enjoy being on the Osage Reservation. I feel like it's almost my second home. Um, and I emphasize that I'm speaking today on the Osage Reservation in spite of the fact that a federal judge recently ruled that this was really Osage County. If you look at the basis for why he ruled that this was Osage County, you'll notice that it's really not based on, on the law. It's based upon his perception of what a reservation should be and his perception of what an Indian tribe should be. I say that because, first of all, t t this morning, I, had, I almost said tonight, but it's this morning still. Uh, this morning, what I'm going to talk about, I'm, I'm going to talk about cultural properties. There are obviously many lawyers here, and they're going to be talking on it as a legal, in a legal sense. I'm going to speak on it in a cultural sense. And what, what are cultural properties? And first of all, if you get into cultural properties issue, as Rebecca particularly pointed out earlier, cultural properties issues are a global issue with indigenous people. Actually, they're a global issue with people who are not considered indigenous. Indigenous, by the way, you want to define indigenous. Indigenous, an indigenous, remember this, Germans are indigenous to Germany, you know, but we don't consider the Germans in Germany as an indigenous population, right? The French are indigenous to France. We don't an indigenous population is a concept, of, uh, indigenous population is a minority population in their historic homeland, who are dominate, who are controlled or basically controlled by a more dominant society. So that's what an indigenous population is. An indigenous population is, is, a, is a small population living where they've always lived, okay? Now, indigenous populations throughout the world, uh, in, prop, uh, cultural properties issues are, in, are, are, are global issues today. Uh, if you, many indigenous groups have been involved in trying to reclaim cultural properties. What are cultural properties? And I, I actually have to, I have to read this because, now, what are, if we look at the specific issues raised by one or another indigenous groups in the world, then cultural properties are or may be thought by some to include all, all of the material items ever made by the group together with their historic sites as well as with their intellectual properties. 
their songs, music, dance, religious beliefs and practices, political organization, their social organization, their folk stories, their botanical, zoological, and other scientific and cultural knowledge, as well as biological heritage. So when we say cultural properties, we're covering a, a broad subject. Basically, we're, we're, when we say we talk about a group's cultural properties, we're talking about everything that that group has possessed, either possessed today and have possessed in the past as well. And in 2007, there was the UN Declaration of the Rights of, uh, uh, Rights of Indigenous People, which addressed these property rights on a global scale. What are indigenous property rights? By the way, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia voted against the Declaration. Uh, they were the only four countries that actually voted against it. A few abstained, but the vast majority voted for it. But now, what I'm going to deal with is the whole problem, issue of what, is, what are cultural properties, and, and particularly, what are the important cultural properties? And I'll get back to the Osage Reservation versus Osage County issue, because that's, that's very much involved in what I'm going to be talking about. If you look at cultural properties as an anthropologist, you see this, these broad, this broad range of issues that are involved. But the core concept in any group's culture is their, what we, we sometimes call it an ethnic myth. All groups have a myth. Now, myth, putting in quotation mark, a myth is their belief in who they are, how they got to be there, and it gives value and meaning to everything they do. All societies have ethnic myths. America, every American Indian group has an ethnic myth. The United States collectively has an ethnic myth. The Germans have an ethnic myth. The Japanese, everybody has an ethnic myth. Okay? This is the myth is the core element in the culture because everything else in that culture is derivative from that myth, one way or another. If we look at American Indians, people today, is there a myth of the Indian? Actually, if we look at American Indian groups, every tribe has a myth of who they are, how they got to be there, and why they're different from everybody else, and why everybody else is not quite what they are. That's part of an ethnic myth. But every, every group, there are 300, 400 ethnic myths with Native American people. But what about a collective myth? What about a collective story? Of course there's a collective story. But the Indians did not create it. The dominant side society created it. Anglo-Americans created it. Anglo-Americans created the myth of the Indian. It's a collective myth. It's collective. It applies to all Indians. Seen one Indian, seen them all. Right? You've always heard that? Well, that's what the myth says. And as we will see, and I'll talk about, everyone is judged in basis, and all things are judged in basis, on, based on that myth and their perception. Some call it the white man's Indian, some call it the imaginary Indian. That's what I'm going to deal with today. This is a cultural property. Myths are cultural properties. Feelings of who you are are cultural property. But this is one that was not created, nor even strongly influenced by American Indians. It has been one that has been created. And this should be the core element in, 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 in the culture, because this is what integrates everything. Now, with that, with that kind of introduction, let me, I ha actually have a paper that I wrote. Ah, here. 
and I'm getting blind as I'm getting older, and uh, the print is awfully small on this. Okay, so I'm going to read it. I hate to read things, but I'm going, I'm going to nonetheless, because I, I, I wanted to try to word this very carefully. When we think of American Indian cultural properties and museums, we usually think of pots, baskets, beadwork, and the like. However, the cultural properties of a group of people include far more than, than tangible objects. In exhibits, museums, through their choice of objects and the context in which they are displayed, communicate powerful subliminal messages to the visitor about the very nature and, uh, of co the culture and the history of the people who created them. The collective knowledge and beliefs about the past are the core elements in any society's intellectual cultural properties, since all other intellectual cultural properties are derivatives from it. It is the intellectual core of a society and its integrative element. Okay. In 1971, as a consultant to the Osage Nation organization, I, I traveled to Washington to testify at a hearing in the House Subcommittee on Indian Affairs. At the time, I was attending an academic conference in New York City, so I took the early morning train to Washington. In Philadelphia, a lawyer, which has something in common with many of the people here today, uh, took the seat beside me. Just before we reached Washington, I, t I told him that I had never been there before, which I hadn't, and, and that uh, I had to attend a meeting at the Sam Rayburn building. Um, scheduled to arrive early for his meeting, he suggested that we share a cab and I could be dropped off first. Okay, because I had no idea how I was going to get a cab. I had never even been in that, in that station before, but let alone go outside to try to get a cab. So he suggested we do this, and he'd, he'd get the cab. When we first got in the cab, he asked what hearing I was attending. On hearing it was on Indian affairs, he began to relate his ideas about Indian issues and, and, and problems. The African-American cab driver at that time, this is 71, they were still African Americans. Now they're Somalis, Africans, Middle Easterners, but at that time they were African Americans. Okay, the African American cab driver quickly joined in. I said little as the cab driver and the lawyer talked about, quote, Indian problems. Only later did I reflect on their conversation. Here were two men with clear ideas about Indian issues and their solutions. However, I doubt that either one of them had ever visited a reservation, had friends or personal contact with Indian people, or had previously given any serious thought to the subject. But boy, they, they had some answers right off the top of their heads. Again, yet in their own minds, they had a clear understanding of the American Indian past and present. What then was the source of their knowledge? Certainly some must have come from high school and or college American history courses. It, was, it is included in those history courses, I think. I haven't had one in a long time, but they're still there. But their major education on American Indians was most likely derived from movies, televisions, comic books, and magazines. The image of the Indian is so pervasive in American popular culture, the studies have shown that by the age of about 10, most children raised in the United States have strong beliefs and opinions concerning the very nature of American Indians. Like the African American cab driver and the lawyer from Philadelphia. They had very strong opinions. In 2005, Anthony Pico, who was mentioned earlier by Dwayne, criticized the media, stating that the portrayal of American Indians in this country's history needs to be debunked because the self-serving rationalization of the past are still robbing generations of American Indians of their lives and futures. Stereotypical ignorance has plagued Indians from the day the first Europeans arrived. The victors not only get the spoils of war, they get to write the history. What Mr. Pico was referring to by the media was certainly the movies, television, magazines, newspapers, and the like. These give both voice and image, visual image, to the myth of the Indian. 
Some scholars have called this myth the white man's Indians, others the imaginary Indian. In essence, this myth presents a, a, a picture of the American Indian past that serves to both complement and validate the idea of manifest destiny. Okay? The myth of the Indian is so per pervasive in American popular culture because the concept of manifest destiny and the myth of the Indian are integrated dependent elements which are, lie at the very core of the generic American ethnic identity and history. You have to realize that. This is the core. This, these two concepts, integrated concepts of manifest destiny and the Indian, are at the very core of American Indian, uh, of American, generic American identity and history. To ch okay. To challenge the myth of the Indian is to challenge the reality of American history as it exists in the collective imagination of the American public. American beliefs about Indians are characterized both by their pervasiveness and consistency over time. If one wishes to understand the basic beliefs of the dominant society concerning the American Indian today, one need only read The Last of the Mohicans. Even when written in 1820, uh, 1826, Cooper was not expressing anything new, but only giving voice to an already existing set of beliefs. In other words, the basic beliefs go back into the, well into the colonial period. While the myth of the Indian is complex in its particulars, the core concept is simple. When Europeans arrived, America was a wilderness occupied by uncivilized savages. Okay, now actually that's redundant. Remember, a savage is a person who's uncivilized, right? That's the basis for saying, and so you say uncivilized savage, you're saying basically the same thing. Wilderness is an area occupied by uncivilized people. Thus, to say America was a wilderness is also to say the people already here were uncivilized or savages. Okay. But that's the real core of the myth. From this are derived a series of corollaries. Indians were never civilized. Indians as Indians were incapable of being civilized. And thus, Indians as Indians cannot exist in the modern world. Captain Pratt summarized this, the, uh, this in his philosophy, you have to kill the Indian to save the man of the Indian boarding schools. But, that's, but this is the whole origin of it, and that's, that's the core. Now, within the myth are a wide range of more particularistic beliefs or stereotypes that are, that are, that are kind of subtext of, of that myth. What concerned Mr. Mr. Pico was the effects of this myth on Indian peoples today both individually and collectively in their relations with members of the dominant society. The myth affects Native Americans socially, economically, politically, and legally. There are lots of studies to show how this actually, the impact of this. And as a, a faculty member at the University of Tulsa, over the years, I've seen many incidents involving American Indian students on the campus and how in trying to resolve these differences, the myth of the Indian came out in dealing with st certain students. Okay. Uh, I can give you particulars on that, but I'd rather not. Um, economically, it affects Indians and perception of Indians. Uh, politically, as we, uh, we see, when we look at legal cases, I mean, with political issues, Wilma Mankiller said, public perception, the political power of public perception is what she was referring to. Pico referred to it too in what Duane was talking about. This affects the political picture. It affects the Indians in a legal sense. One of, the, one of the interesting studies I was involved in back in the early 1970s, we did a study of sentencing of Indians in the state of Oklahoma. And we we've we've divided them into two parts. We divide them into crimes against individuals, crimes of violence against individuals, and crimes against property. Okay? 
and we looked at sentencing patterns and compared those to sentencing patterns of non-Indians. If, if you caught an Indian shoplifter, they were usually given a much lighter sentence than a white shoplifter. However, an Indian involved in a crime of violence, physically involved in violence, either with their fist or with some weapon, was given a much harsher sentence than non-Indian offenders having the same crime. Okay? It's simple. On one hand, you get, and it actually brought this way, as we did, the noble savage. You know, noble savages are not materialist. If an Indian steals something, he's got a real compelling reason. It's not just for property. White people will steal just to get things, but an Indian has to have a reason. And that was undoubtedly the, some of the underlying assumptions. However, if an Indian convinced has a, is involved in a crime of violence, suddenly they become the red devil. Okay, so you've got Uncas, who's a shoplifter, and Mugwa, who, who, who attacks people. And, and the courts in their sentencing actually made a distinction between crimes of violence and crimes of, uh, of, uh, of against property. Okay, but that, so that, now they're not thinking this. They're, they're, not, they're not conscious of this, but these are the underlying assumptions based on the myth of the Indian that the courts are doing. So what it means is, gosh, be an Indian shoplifter, but don't get in a fight while you're doing it. Uh, that's uh, what I was saying. Now, that was 1970s. I have no idea what it's like today. We hope that things have changed. And Indian shoplifters get better sentences and Indian he, uh, involved in crimes of violence gets better. But, but this is how deep it is. It really is very penetrating. Now, by the way, I even heard in academics once saying, getting back to the whole myth of the Indian, it was about a, a, a graduate student wanting to go into the sciences. And somebody said, you know, Indians don't think scientifically. And they're not civilized. So they were against granting money to an Indian who has wanted to go into the sciences, to graduate work in the sciences. So, no, it, it has a very deep impact. Not only does the mythic white man's Indian affect the dominant society's attitude toward Native Americans, even more frighteningly, it has increasingly influenced how younger Native Americans define themselves in their past. Um, I always wanted Tony to publish. A, uh, some of you from Muskogee may have known Anthony Dexter Brown or Tony Brown. Tony Brown's a Creek Cherokee. He became a sci uh, child psychologist, taught at UCLA, died a couple of years ago. Anyway, back in the, back in the 70s, he wrote a paper called The Hollywood Indian is the Indian. And it was really an excellent paper showing how how Hollywood or this mythic Indian was affecting younger Indians. And because he had worked with them as, as children, as a psychologist, he had worked with them. And I, I, I called Tony, because I, I wanted to use it in a class, because I actually heard him give it in 1975 at, a, at an academic meeting. And I called him and said, can I get a copy of that, or have you published it? And he said, Garrick, Tony was my roommate as an undergraduate for some time. He said, Garrick, I'm afraid to publish it. If I went back home to Oklahoma, some of those people had come after me for writing that. And he was probably right. But since then, there have been quite a few other academic studies that have shown the same thing about the myth of the Indian or this mythic Indian and how it's affected Indian peoples and their per, uh, perception of the self. Basically, the future of the Indian peoples in the United States is largely dependent upon redefining the Indian past. The question is how. In, in 1995, the All Apache Cultural Committee, and I think this evolved into the Western Apache NAGPRA working group. I think the same people, are, Ramon Riley and some are involved in it, uh, claimed exclusive control over all things relating to the Apache people, their culture, history, all popular and academic materials. They also stated that henceforth anyone wishing to write about the Apache will have to gain permission of the tribes. Now, while one can understand and appreciate their concerns over the public perception of the Apache, and they were concerned with the public perception of the Apache, we also know that such control 
is direct control is virtually impossible. Michael Brown, in his recent book on who owns native culture, states, the reality of pluralistic democracy is that groups living together must be free to talk about one another's history and culture. Okay. He further states that all societies indulge in some degree of self-mythologizing. He's right on both points. In a, in a pluralistic society, people have to talk to each other about their culture and history. He's also right that all societies indulge in, actually, he says self-mythologizing. That's just developing an ethnic myth. That's what I would say. Okay, all societies do it. The problem is that we have not had a dialogue, but a monologue, as Anglo-Americans alone define the Native American past and present. As to self-mythologizing, by Native Americans, the pervasive self-mythologizing of the dominant society has increasingly forced Indian people to redefine their own past by placing a positive spin on portions of the white man's myth of the Indian. And I think this is what's happened so many times is that basically in self-defense and in a vacuum, what many people have been forced to do, Indian people have been forced to do, is go to the positive thing. Now, in other words, what they want to do is they want to become the noble savage. They want to become Chief Seattle in his speech that he never gave, but a white man wrote. Certainly that's preferable to becoming Mugwa, uh, but at the same time, it's still playing to the myth. And I think this is, this is one of the, the problems about, about it. Is you, you're, you're, that neither one of them, neither Mugwa or Uncas, represents the reality of the American pa Indian past. Pico called for the media to change. The media image of the Indian is and can only reflect the prevailing stereotypes and beliefs of the dominant society. Always remember that. You're not going to get television or the movies to come out with great films or great programs that are going to directly challenge the myth of the imaginary Indian. They're never, they're never going to do it. Why? Because they depend upon revenue. And if the public saw that, they'd say, oh, this is a bunch of nonsense, because I know it's not like that, because I saw, I don't know, what, what did they say? Um, they grew up on, you know, Lone Ranger and Tonto television. They read it in the comic books. And that's not the picture of the comic books. That's not the picture of television. Uh, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not the, the picture of the American Indian that you see in a John Wayne movie. So it's untrue. The, 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 the image of the Indian is very firmly implanted in the thinking of the American public. Now, so the media, can't, uh, the media cannot do anything about it. Academics and their research and writing cannot change the prevailing stereotypes and beliefs of the dominant society. Believe it or not, and this is I'm speaking to my academic colleagues here, we have almost no influence in America. We can write about these subjects as much as we want to. We can redefine the past. We can challenge the myth as much as we And you know who reads most of our works? Other academics and not the public. We have, we have very little effect upon the general public. As Duane pointed out with, uh, I think it was Anthony Pico who said that, and, and with uh, Wilma Mankiller, museums are the key element in what you would have to call the re-education of the American public. Because that's where the general public is really exposed 
in a massive way to academic ideas concerning the topic. You know, muse museums, as, they've, as, as Duane and, uh, pointed out too, museums have, in many cases, historically, museums have only served to communicate or reinforce the past. In other words, the, the existing image of the American Indian. Now, NAGPRA has had an important effect on museums in synthesizing them to Indian concerns and increasing Indian consultation in museum exhibits concerning Native Americans. Now, however, museums have unconsciously, by overemphasizing historic Indian culture, cultural properties, and by this, I'm ba mainly talking about 19th century Indian properties. Have inadvertently reinforced the prevailing, uh, prevailing stereotype of the Indian, or that part of the stereotype, by saying or communicating a message all too often that the only real Indian is a dead Indian. Okay? that Indian culture really is not alive today. Rarely have museums addressed the issue of Amer American, Native American cultural development and civilization prior to European arrival. I think, and this is what bothers me as a, as a teacher over the years, few Native American people realize that their ancestors created a true civilization, the so-called Mississippi civilizations one of the best kept secrets in the American past. In other words, the Mississippian civilization were the people involved with Spyro, with, uh, with Cahokia, with Moundsville, with Etowah, who built, those, who built those major centers. Few people really appreciate the level of sophistication that those people reached in terms of the arts. You look at the stone carvings, the stone bowls and other carvings. These things are equal with any civilization in the world. You look at the copper work, you look at the shell work, you look at the ceramics, and what you see is a real civilization. We had an exhibit at the Art Institute of Chicago, Hero Hawk and Open Hand. I think it opened in or closed or something in 2004, several Actually, that was a combined exhibit that involved the Art Institute and officially 11 tribes were formally involved in it. It was a cooperative exhibit between the tribes because so much of the material came under NAGPRA uh, and, and the Art Institute of Chicago. This is the largest exhibit, or as large an exhibit has ever mounted by the Art Institute of Chicago. And the Art Institute of Chicago is a big museum, okay? I've forgotten how many objects were involved. The interesting thing about it, they had, uh, the National Endowment for Humanities requires a, uh, a, an exit, kind of an exit poll to get impressions. Almost everybody agreed this was a civilization. In other words, we hadn't stretched it by, by pre presenting this as a major civilization that had been ignored. A civilization on par with any early civilization in the world. And the public, by seeing it, agreed. There's only one disturbing fact. Did they think of this as an American Indian civilization? And most said no, they didn't. You can't say it once. There's an old thing in, in the academic world. You can't write the article once. You have to rewrite it several times before people take notice of it. So that was a one-shot thing. It did not have the impact. But when I say that Native American peoples created a civilization that other people will recognize as a civilization, that's true. 
Anglo-America will recognize the Mississippian civilization as a true civilization. And for the people in Oklahoma, what's important is that most of the people in Oklahoma, most of the Indian people in Oklahoma are the direct descendants of the people who created it. Okay, that's one thing that museums, I, I do not think that, that museums have done that. Even more, uh, even more rarely, have museums addressed the, in, the issue of contemporary Indian culture, not as an anachronism, but as an ever-changing, ongoing, living cultural tradition. American Indian people are not, you know what I always get submitted. Now, now I, I like, I like to go to Santa Fe, I buy pots, I buy baskets. In fact, cousin of one of the people in the audience, Jim Redcorn, used to call me the curio kid. Uh, anything kind of interesting, I, I would buy. Okay? There's nothing wrong with them. I like them. But you know, most of those things are tourist arts. They're based on Indians as an anachronism. So the shows of contemporary, many times, contemporary American Indian art is not showing it as a living tradition. When I talk about a living tradition, I mean people like Bill Rice wearing a ribbon work tie. That's part of a living tradition. I mean, like when I, I was upset one time uh, several years ago. I, I was up at the Osage Tribal Museum, and Carl Ponca was the, the director at that time. And Carl Ponca brought out a, a pair of moccasins Osage-style moccasins, except they were in day-glow beads. Now, I'm an anthropologist. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm criticizing some, museums doing something that I appreciate. Day-glow beads just don't make it for me. But then I thought, you know what they indicated? That's a living cultural tradition. An Osage can put beadwork in day-glow beads on the moccasins because it's not dead. It's not a dead culture. It's a living culture. And you see this in so many, so many facets in American Indian culture today in the communities. American Indian culture is a living tradition. It's a living, changing tradition. Yes, it's rooted in the past, but all traditions are rooted in the past. It's when American Indians cannot put dagolo beads on their moccasins. It's when American Indian Lawyers cannot wear ribbon work ties that American Indian culture is becoming dead. It's not something of the past. It's something in the present. And I don't think museums have fully appreciated that and have exhibited in the, in the proper manner. Okay? No. Museums are... Oh. Okay, museums are by, f by far the best and most effective venue for reaching and influencing the general public. Unfortunately, museums, and I'm speaking collectively, have yet to fully recognize the responsibilities they have to the peoples whose cultural properties they hold and whose cultural images they project. In other words, I don't think museums necessarily do not think, okay, what kind of image of the Indian are we projecting? The overall project, not just what we're saying. Not just a bunch of pretty objects, but what collectively message is this sending to the viewer about them? Okay. And also, I don't think that museums, artists in Chicago, I know other people have done it as well, um, they have, museums collectively have not challenged in a meaningful and consistent manner the myth of the white man's Indian. The, the myth of the Indian both uh, demeans and trivializes American Indians past and present and basically endangers their future. Okay. Let's just stop here. Okay. <laughs>